I'd like to thank Dr. Ramchandani and Dr. Fontana and Dr. Reardon for inviting me to speak today in this very advanced and uh, visionary group. I, I really think this is an honor for me to be included. I am what you call the extremist in surgery. surgery. I am the maximally invasive surgeon. I've made my entire career doing arches, thoracic abdominals, valve sparing roots and such, and I went from that to percutaneous aortic valve replacement. So it's true, my wife always called me extremist, and I've proven it here with my surgery. Well, yesterday, if you saw the initial talk by Dr. Ramchandani, he showed a aerial view of the Houston Medical Complex. And I don't know about you, but I was really impressed. Within there, there were three universities, 28 hospitals, and they employed over 100,000 people. And that doesn't include the new hospital that Dr. Reardon showed me yesterday, which is going to be 28 floors with an entire floor with 10 hybrid rooms. Now, if you don't leave here thinking that Texas does things bigger and better, I don't know what it takes to impress you. And I'm talking about this because I show you with great trepidation and meekness my next slide. <laughs> this is our puny little five-story cardiovascular center at the University of Michigan. But within that small, tiny little building, we house the Department of Cardiac Surgery, the divisions of cardiology, vascular cardiology, and interventional radiology. And the nice thing about that small little business building is it's a collaborative effort between those four divisions, our department and the other three divisions, in which we strive to bring quality care to patients in total collaboration with everything centered on family and patient-focused care. And so I think this is what the future is going to be, and I think we need to embrace this type of a future, and I think we need to work closely and collaboratively with our colleagues. Well, as Tom has so eloquently pointed out, uh, there has been extensive um, TAVR research done, clinical trials spearheaded by the FDA which were randomized, prospective, and multi-centered, in which they took patients with severe symptomatic uh, aortic stenosis in the native aortic valve and uh, did these trials in non-surgical and high-risk surgical candidates. And the uh, excellent superior results in these trials between TAVR and medical therapy for the non-surgical candidates and between TAVR and surgical aortic valve for the high-risk candidates made TAVR a recommended treatment of choice for patients with aortic valve stenosis in a native valve who are considered non-surgical and high-risk candidates. Well, it wasn't a far leap to consider performing TAVR in patients with failed biological valves who were considered non-surgical and uh, high-risk patients. And so today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to present the self-expanding transcatheter aortic valve uh, data in patients with failed surgical prosthesis, the one-year results of the core valve US trial. This was, I presented at the TCT last year, and Mike asked me to come and repeat this talk today. These are my disclosures. Well, the core valve US expanded use trial is a prospective non-randomized multicentral trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the self-expanding core valve for failure of a bioprosthetic surgical aortic valve with either stenosis, insufficiency, or combined disease in patients considered non-surgical or high-risk surgical candidates. Now this trial, as you notice, is a non-randomized trial because the FDA felt that in patients with native severe aortic valve stenosis who were considered non-surgical or high-risk candidates, if it was proven to be superior with TAVR, well, certainly they were not going to randomize these patients who are going to have a more extreme surgery, such as a redo surgery, and so they sanctioned this as a non-randomized trial. All these patients were vetted through this screening committee that Dr. Reardon had mentioned earlier, which consisted of Dr. Reardon as the chairman of the screening committee, two cardiologists, Dr. Jeff Popma from Beth Israel in Boston, Steve Yakabov from Columbus, Ohio, and myself as a second surgeon from Michigan. There were four valves studied, ranging in sizes from 23 to 31 millimeters. These serviced uh, intra internal diameters of the uh, surgical aortic valves, ranging in size from 17 to 29 millimeters. And all valves were delivered by an 18 French system. The majority of valves were performed transfemorally, 
and those that could not be by transfemoral access were performed secondarily either by axillary or direct aortic approach. There were 113 patients enrolled in the study, 109 underwent attempted implantation. Three patients expired between enrollment and implantation, and one patient was withdrawn by the physician. Of the 109 uh, attempted implants, 107 were successfully implanted. One patient died from complications of access prior to implantation, and a second patient was exited by the implanter when the uh, intra-procedure TEE showed severe patient prosthesis mismatch, and the uh, implanter felt that this was not a suitable candidate. As you can see, this is a study compliance, and as Tom talked about earlier, you have to have excellent study compliance uh, to have good data. And uh, as you can see, the 30-day and the one-year follow-up was uh, very high. The failure mortality of the previous uh, valve included stenosis in 62% of the patients, insufficiency in 15% of the patients, and combined disease in 24% of the patients. Baseline clinical characteristics are noted that these patients are older. The average age was 77 years. 69% of these patients were male. The STS score for mortality was higher than that in the S3 uh, study. It was 9.5. Uh, the combined mortality and morbidity, 36. And 90% of these patients were class 3, class 4 failure. The average age of the uh, surgical aortic valve was 10 years. 85% of the valves were stented. And the majority of uh, patients had medium-sized valves, which were 23 and 25 millimeters, about 53% of the patients. And I want you to note that we categorize patients as small valve 1921, medium 23, 25, and large 27, 29. And this will have a uh, purpose later when I show some slides. The way we uh, size the TAV and SAV is we use the internal stent diameter of the specific model of valve and size of valve using an application which was developed by Dr. Bapat in UBQO technology. The TAV of sizes that were implanted were 56% uh, 23 millimeter valve, 28% uh, 26 millimeter, so that the majority of valves implanted were the smaller valves. We de uh, define device and procedural success uh, under the following guidelines. Device success occurred in 92.5% of the patients, and it was defined as successful vascular access, delivery, deployment of the device, and retrieval of the delivery system. These devices had to be delivered in the correct anatomic position with no impedance to flow, and there had to be one valve in the proper anatomic position. And this was accomplished in 92.5% of the patients. There was only one patient who ended up with malposition of the valve. Procedural success occurred in 91% of the patients, and that was defined as device success in the absence of a major adverse cardiovascular or cerebrovascular event. Of note, there were no acute coronary artery occlusions in this group, which was the Achilles heel that was suggested for TAV and SAV. The significant endpoint studied in this uh, trial was all-cause mortality and major stroke. And as you can see, for a redo procedure, the all-cause mortality and or major stroke, not just mortality, but com combination, was 2.8% at one month, 8.4% at six months, and 15% at one year. All-cause mortality was 1.8% at 30 days, 6.5% at six months, and 13.4% at 12 months. Cardiovascular mortality was less than 1% at 30 days, 2.8 at six months, and 8% at 12 months. All-cause mortality by a failure, a structural mode of failure, showed no statistically significant difference whether the patients had failure by stenosis, insufficiency, or combined disease. Secondary endpoints studied were all stroke. At 30 days, this used to be the Achilles heel of, of TAVRs. It was less than 1%, and it was 4% at one year. Major stroke, once again, less than 1%, 3.1% at one year. New permanent pacemaker implantation was 6.6% with 11% at one year. The hemodynamics. The mean valvular gradient fell from 41 millimeters of mercury down to 
millimeters of mercury at one year, and at every point studied was statistically significantly lower than the baseline mean valvular gradient. Likewise, the effective orifice area rose, and the new effective orifice area after procedure was statistically significantly better at every time point going to 1.36. However, if you look at these mean valvular gradients, these are in stark contrast to those of TAVR and a native valve. The core valve uh, high risk and low uh, and um, non-surgical patients, the data presented all the mean valvular gradients were in single digits. This now has one of 16 percent at one, or 16 millimeters of mercury at one year. Well, the question that I had is, what is the impact of a higher mean valvular gradient in the TAV and SAV patients versus the native aortic valve patients? To determine that, what I did is we divided the patients at the time of discharge into two groups, those with a mean valvular gradient of less than 20 millimeters of mercury and those with a mean valvular gradient equal to or greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. And if you follow out their mortality, you can see a distinct difference in separation in those curves. And although at one year it did not reach exact statistical significance at 0 0.06, the hazard ratio is three times higher for a patient who leaves with a mean valvular gradient of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury at the, at the time of discharge. And so for me, although it's not statistically significant, this has serious clinical relevance. In an effort to try to determine what was driving the higher gradient at discharge, we looked at three uh, factors which may impact the mean valvular gradient. We divided the patients into modality of failure, surgical valve size into small, medium, and large, based on those sizes that I showed earlier, and the predicted patient prosthesis mismatch of the surgical aortic valve at the time of TAVR. And uh, we then looked at the mean gradient by predicted uh, patient prosthesis mismatch and noted that at discharge in one month, those patients that had severe and moderate patient prosthesis mismatch had a statistically significant higher mean valvular gradient. And that patient prosthesis mismatch, as I said, was based on the effective orifice area of that particular valve that we put the TAVR in based on the IFU data for that particular valve divided by the uh, body surface area at that patient to determine whether that patient had patient prosthesis mismatch when we were implanting that valve. Then we looked at the salve size. And once again, you can see for the small valve sizes, patients had a statistically significant high gradient, higher gradient at the time of discharge. We looked at modality of therapy. That alone, as an independent predictor, had no effect on the mean valvular gradient. However, if you combined the modality of failure with large, medium, and small size valves and looked at the gradient, you can see those patients who had stenosis and had small valves all had, had on an average a mean valvular gradient greater than 20, and with the medium valves had a mean valvular gradient near 20. If you looked at the mean valvular gradient in relationship to modality of therapy and patient prosthesis mismatch, once again, if you had stenosis, and you had moderate or severe patient prosthesis mismatch with your uh, surgical implanted valve, you had a mean valvular gradient greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. And once again, if you combine small valves with patient prosthesis mismatch, once again, any form of patient prosthesis mismatch in the small or medium valve gave you a hazard ratio of three times more death. So if you don't think patient prosthesis mismatch is a relevant thing, you need to stop and rethink about that. If you look at total aortic regurgitation, moderate to severe, there was 6.4% at 12 months and 3.1% at uh, one month. The New York Heart Classification 3 and 4 went from 90% at baseline to 7% at one year. And the KCC overall uh, quality of life summary showed a marked improvement uh, from baseline at uh, one month and was statistically significantly higher throughout the entire uh, time of follow-up in the study. In conclusion, 
Tav and SAV is a safe and effective therapy for patients with failing surgical bioprosthesis who are not candidates for or at high risk for open heart surgery. There is a high device success at 92.5% with only one patient uh, with malposition and a high procedural success with no acute coronary artery occlusions. The mortality and stroke rate at one year is lower than the published data for this patient population treated medically, which is 40 to 50% at one year, or with open surgery in the extreme high risk or non-surgical candidates, which varies somewhere between 15 and 33%. As you noted, it was 1.8% in this trial. TAV and SAV significantly improves the quality of life as reflected by the improvement in New York heart classification and KCC scores. Residual mean valvular gradient greater than 20 millimeters of mercury at discharge appears to be associated with a higher mortality rate at one year and is clinically relevant. Factors that are associated with a higher residual mean valvular gradient are small surgical valves and patients with prosthetic mismatch. A combination of aortic stenosis in a prosthetic device, failed prosthetic device, in a small valve with patient prosthesis mismatch has the largest impact on the mean valvular gradient at 30 days and the mortality at one year. Small valves in themselves without patient prosthesis mismatch do not cause high mortality. And so the limiting factor for TAV and SAV procedure and the surgical aortic valve implanted at the initial procedure, that is the limiting factor for TAV and SAV. The valve that we put in as surgeons on the initial procedure. It is imperative that the most appropriately matched surgical valve size to patient size is implanted to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. On behalf of the Core Valve US uh, investigators, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present this data.